So instead of saying it like this, this question, I would actually word it a little bit different. How would I grow my relationship more with God? And that's essentially how I would rephrase the question because if you put a criteria on your relationship in terms of a hierarchy, you will create a confusion. You will be messed up as far as, okay, how do I get closer to the Lord? How do I do this? How do I do that? Welcome everybody. It's me, Nathaniel Sanchez. You already know it's another week a new video talking about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're getting right into it on the second episode of the Can You series. So we're just doing one question today and it goes as follows. Besides prayer and fasting, what would you say is in third place to get closer to God? So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything, Father, for you were all and I give it the glory and honor for everything, Father that we continue to ask for forgiveness of any sin, rebellion, mistake, anything that has not that has been displeasing in your eyes, anything that has kept us away from you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we continue to worship you, honor you, and praise you, and glorify you, that you continue to reveal yourself to your creation, that you continue to speak to your people, you continue to tend to your children, you continue to be a, a heavenly father, a good and loving father to your children, for these are yours and yours alone. Holy Spirit, that I continue to disappear behind the cross, that the cross continues to be elevated, continues to be glorified because of the one who resurrected from the dead, Lord Jesus Christ, that he continues to receive all the glory and all the honor, that I continue to decrease as he increases, that nobody hears me and everybody forgets me, but that they hear the Son, they see the Son, and that they experience his presence. Holy Spirit, that you continue to transform the minds of those who are in need, those who need healing, those who need transformation, those who need rejuvenation, regeneration. Holy Spirit, continue to pierce the heart of stone and transform it to a heart of flesh, that you continue to renew them and renew their minds and their ears and their mouths and everything that you do, that they continue to draw closer to God and that they give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So instead of saying it like this, this question, I would actually word it a little bit different. How would I grow my relationship more with God? And that's essentially how I would rephrase the question because if you put a criteria on your relationship in terms of a hierarchy, you will create a confusion. You will be messed up as far as, okay, how do I get closer to the Lord? How do I do this? How do I do that? What's more important? What's least important? So I don't want you to think that it is a rule-based salvation. It is not by your works that you can be saved. It is by grace through faith alone. Now, there are things that when you are saved that bear fruit, that produce the works, but it's not you working to be saved that causes you or makes you to be saved, but rather that the salvation of Jesus Christ that you receive and that you accept as Lord and Savior, then you desire to grow closer to the Lord. Then you desire to do the things of the Lord. Then you desire to do the will of God. That becomes natural, becomes second nature to you because now you're walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Here, we're going to Psalm chapter 7, verses 8 through 17 out of the ESV translation. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God, my shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will weep his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violent descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. So given to the context of this 
the verses that we were reading. So it's actually talking about David, who is being slandered by a man of Benjamin, a tribe from Saul, you know, while he was king, before he gets stripped of his kingship. So pretty much people were just talking bad about him and everything. And David was saying, help me, search me. You know, if, if I had done something wrong, let me know. But if I am considered righteous in your eyes, defend me, protect me. You are my shield and all that. Now, he wasn't righteous on his own merit. He was righteous because he knew that there would be a savior, there would be a promised Messiah that would rectify sin and would cleanse him of the sin. So he was accredited righteousness on a future savior, on a future Messiah. So the first step to answer this question would be, and this is what I would ask you, and you can also ask yourself, who is God to you? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in some higher power or being? Do you believe that the universe itself is God? Do you believe that you yourself is God? Do you believe in multiple gods? There'll be two routes that you go about it. You'll either reject God because of sinful rebellion, our natural tendency when we're in the flesh, when we're in the world. And here we're jumping to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1, 2, and 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of the disobedient, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So if you're in rebellion with Christ, if you're in rebellion with God, then you're naturally wanting to hate the things of God and hate God. So you don't care about the the word of God. You don't care about the Bible. You don't care about praying. You don't care about fasting. You don't care about a lot of stuff. You just want to do whatever you want to do. The second route is when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then now you desire to pray, you desire to fast, and then you also desire to read the word. And we'll get to that part later. And how do we know from the text? As we know from Apostle Paul, who spoke to the church of Ephesians, the Ephesians, talking about, you know, ways of how to live a Christian life, you know, what it is to be saved by Lord Jesus Christ, what it is to reject Christ and not receive salvation. So we're going to continue in this chapter, chapter 2, but we're going to verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So this is the two paths you have to pick before you can even start getting closer to God because you might be wrestling with some stuff. If you're in rebellion, well, then this happens. We stay in our own path, our own decisions. Whether we like it or not, that is the objective truth due to the fall of Adam and Eve when they introduced sin and essentially saying that because of the sin, because of the curse, you know, we are sinful in nature you know we have a tendency to do that that's why we have to come to christ that's why we have to receive salvation to be set free from the curse while we're on this path we are greedy envious lustful liars violent wrathful impatient arrogant or ignorant until something happens and this is when friends and family members are praying for you so that way you come to christ that way God reveals himself to you and starts to change your heart. And God knows how to address everybody. He does it in his time, in his will, in accordance to his purposes. So we trust in him knowing that those who are unsaved, that will be our friends, our family members, our co-workers, people like that of that nature. Well, they will come to Christ and they will receive salvation because we desire them to be forgiven of their sin, their rebellious life, and say, no more of the past, no more being dead to sin, but now you're alive in Christ. The second thing that we're going to talk about is prayer. And I know I mentioned it a while back in one of the videos that we would talk about prayer. So we're going to start opening it up and then eventually we'll get deeper into prayer. So that way you can understand how to focus on your prayer life. We're all familiar with something called the Lord's Prayer. So here we're going to Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 through 15. And this is Jesus talking to the multitude during the Sermon on the Mount, starting at verse 5. 
And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So the Lord's Prayer is a framework of what to pray, how to pray, and all that. This is the, the only way to pray. That's why, in general, you either hear pastors or leaders or prophets or teachers or evangelists, fellow Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you'll hear them pray a certain style. It'll be tailored to their prayer life, you know, how devoted they are in reading the word, applying the word in their life, how they are in making sure that they live a holy, righteous, pure life, because Jesus commands us to live that life through the accredited righteousness he gives us. So it'll be different. It won't be exactly the same, but it'll be a framework. And it'll be as follows. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So God getting all the glory. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we don't want the will, our own will, but we want the will of heaven. So we want the will of God to be on earth. So that way his kingdom continues to advance Whatever he has prepared for that day spoken from eternity's past is going to happen. Whether it be praying for somebody, preaching the gospel to somebody, testifying of the power of the gospel in your life, transforming you. So that way it leads to the gospel being proclaimed. Whatever it may be, that's the will in that essence when it comes to the will of God. Give us this day our daily bread reading the word and also that we are provisioned with physical food so we start off with reading the word every morning you know if we're in a rush or we wake up late it happens we end up having to read it later or hear it on the phone or through audio but we make sure we read the word so that way we can understand that this is what the lord wants us to receive he corrects us he convicts us he encourages us to apply the word in our life and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and of course, you can take it from a physical aspect, you know, pay your bills, pay off your loans, pay off your debts. But also, if somebody has wronged you, you know, just forgive them. If they do ask for forgiveness, don't allow it to harbor deceit or anger in you. Let it go. Let it be granted, depending on what they did towards you, you know, the sin or the distrust or the harm. Some of it won't be as easy to forgive at that moment this is where you come into prayer and say lord address my heart allow me to forgive as your son forgave me and others it didn't matter what sin i committed but when i came to christ it was washed and cleansed by the blood of christ and the blood alone so that's how he wants us to forgive others he wants us to not dwell on it and just let it be in the past and never bring it up again and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil so that way we don't fall into temptation, obviously, but also that when temptation arises, that we use wisdom, we use knowledge, we walk firm in our faith, knowing that God didn't lead us to temptation, rather that the adversary, the world, our flesh wants to do things contrary to the, to the will of God, to the things of God, and that we are strengthened by the Lord, that we are sustained by the Lord to resist that temptation. And that we flee from it so that way we're not held as a slave to sin. Then that we're not stuck in that bondage to sin, but that we're free in Christ and that we are servants to Christ. And the Lord does take that serious. You know, if he forgave us when we accepted his son as Lord and Savior, well, then he's going to expect us to forgive others. That's going to be something that has to be developed and grown. Again, certain actions aren't as easy to forgive at the moment, but over time, as you understand and remember that forgiveness is also mercy and grace and just saying that enough is enough i'm just gonna let it be you know i forgive you 
that's it. I'm going to squash it. No more. You know, you're not letting the person off the hook, but you're also letting them know that at the end of the day, God forgave us. So we forgive others. And we also ask for forgiveness when we do wrong, because sometimes we make a mistake. You know, sometimes I've had to ask for forgiveness through recordings. I've had to do it in person to people. I've had to do it in a public setting. So when you are wrong and the Lord convicts you, same thing. You ask for forgiveness and that they forgive you as well. So that way you continue to be set free and also walk in the freedom that Christ has given you. So continuing into prayer, it's pretty much communion, communicating with God. So it's going to be a two-way street, you know, like a relationship, whether to a parent, to a child, and a romantic relationship, a husband, a wife, co-workers, you know, managers to employees. You know, there is that type of relationship. So most of the time you're going to be pouring your heart out. And that's good because you want your Heavenly Father to see that you do trust him, that you do want him to hear you. You do want to talk to him. You know, it's not just by reading the word, but you have to put those together. And prayer allows you to grow closer to God and develop that relationship. Because then just like as you develop a relationship with somebody, whether romantic or not, you know, you want to gain that trust. The Lord wants you to trust in him so that way you can walk in eternal life. He doesn't want you to be in eternal punishment. He doesn't want you to be eternally condemned. But if you decide not to cultivate a relationship with the Lord and you just want to do your own thing, well, then he says, okay, that's what you want. Here it is. Do what you want. And then you go from there. By you not praying, by you not seeking prayer, well, then you don't have that intimate relationship with the Lord. You're not seeking the will of God. You're not seeking the things of God. You're not seeking fellowship with other believers in Christ, whether at church or in fellowships with Bible study or just hanging out. You're not doing a lot of those things that allow you to grow spiritually and allow you to grow closer to the Lord because God is patient. He's a good, loving father that he's not going to force himself on you. There'll be moments where he'll show himself. He'll reveal himself to you and say, hey, this is who I am. But at some point, if you choose not to do it, then he allows you to do your own thing. And then this is where the adversary, the devil, Satan, he'll try to devour you because he prowls like a roaring lion, ready to eat those who are weak, those who are considered prey, and that you continue to be pulled away from God and continue in the influences of the world and be friends of the world. And God doesn't want you to be friends with the world. He wants you to be friends with God. He wants you to be considered an enemy towards the world because the world hates Jesus and by default, they will hate you. So how do you pray to God? And essentially, it's just a conversation like I was mentioning, whether it's five minutes or five hours, it's not going to be the same style every day, you know, whether it be in your room or while you're driving or if you have an al um, alone time or a moment at work. You know, be respectful. You are getting paid to work, so you can't just stop what you're doing to do it. But essentially, you just separate some time and you just pour out your heart. You say, Lord, thank you for being God. Thank you for being my father. Thank you for you being you. I glorify you. I worship you. You know, I ask for forgiveness, whether I know I did something wrong or not. And then you pray for others. You pray about your situation. You pour your heart out. You vent your frustrations. You do whatever it is you want to talk about because God can hear all and he is patient and he just wants to hear you because he wants you to grow that relationship. So we see in the Bible that Jesus, he often prayed to God the Father in the alone time, always seeking the will of the Father. And since God is spirit, that's how we communicate to God. You can't just write a letter and deliver it to him as you would to a person. You have to communicate supernaturally to a supernatural God, and that's one of the ways you do it. So essentially, that is an overview of prayer. Now, the next one is what is fasting. And here we're going to Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And fasting is a denial of flesh and your own desires. So you don't eat food. You just stay in 
water and prayer and reading the word because as it is written in the word in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, he says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by the words of God, by the words of the spirit. I paraphrase it a little bit um, because Satan was trying to test Jesus with, you know, make this rock become bread, you know, feed yourself because he was fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. So with fasting, you're essentially denying yourself. So you're not on social media. You're not eating. Um, some people do a Daniel fast where it's 21 days and you just eat vegetables and fruit, all natural and all that. Um, that's a good fast as well. You know, it's going to be case by case scenario. Uh, do be prayer, obviously, before you do something like that. You don't want to go cold turkey. You will shock your body. You can actually get sick and stuff like that. So let's not do that. Let's be smart and let's use wisdom. But as you fast, you know, you don't do it every single day. You just do it periodically. There are some people who do a weekly one 24 hour fast. So they take once a week to do it. Some people from time to time will do a three day water fast only. Some people do, as I mentioned, the 21 day fast. Some people have done a 40 day fast. I have not done a 40 day water fast only. I did something a little bit different. I pretty much was just eating once a day and I've relinquished my monthly income to the Lord one whole month. And I was the Lord just showing himself in a mighty way that I don't even know how to put it into words. Um, so that was my 40 day fast. You know, it's going to be a little bit different with everybody, but you want to grow your relationship with God as well. So you read the word more and you pray even more as well, because by you being in prayer, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God is sustaining you and filling you. And that's another way you get closer because you want that intimacy. If you fast to get something to do an expectation or a blessing, well, then that will be seen as a form of manipulation. And God doesn't have that. If you are going to fast and you are going to deny yourself and food and all that, it is because you want to grow closer to the Lord. And in the beginning, we all make mistakes where we fast to get something, to receive something. And there is grace, there is mercy. But as you develop your relationship, well, then you start becoming wiser and smarter. The Lord starts correcting you. He starts teaching you and says, okay, this is how you're supposed to do it. This is how you're going to do it. He makes changes in accordance to what you are in your spiritual walk. So while you're fasting, you may be asking, well, how do I stay focused on the Lord? So obviously I mentioned reading the Bible, but let's say if you read one chapter, you'll read two chapters. If you tend to read five verses, you'll read 10 verses. If you read for 10 minutes, you read for 30 minutes. You do more of reading the word. If you pray for five minutes, well, then you pray for 10. If you pray for 30 minutes, you'll pray for an hour. If you pray only in the morning, then you'll pray morning and night. You do more. You continue to immerse yourself in reading the Bible and reading biblical content and watching biblical content, you know, stuff on YouTube. So that's what I did one time in one of my fasts. I was on YouTube and just absorbing everything about God. You need the sermon. Not every video on YouTube that is considered Christian is Christian. There are Christian agnostics who claim to be Christian but believe in a higher power that is not Jesus Christ. There is New Age Christian teaching that use teachings of the Bible and put it in New Age that you can be God, that you are one with God in nature, that so much that's going on is it's chaos. You know, be in prayer, be led by the Spirit, and what you watch on YouTube and stuff like that, because you just never know. Also, the type of music you listen to. So if you listen to a lot of worldly secular music that doesn't promote biblical values, that doesn't promote Christianity, well, then you're going to transition out of that and listen to more worship that is biblically sound music. Because not all worship music is biblically sound either. There's some that promote worship of self, but it sounds Christian or it sounds good. That's one thing you also have to be careful. One thing with fasting, your discernment, you know, how to... How to differentiate between good and evil, whether angels or demons or stuff like that, you know, bad teaching, false teaching, even more of that nature will grow because you are denying the flesh and you're crucifying it. So you're able to focus on the Lord more and hear his voice even clearer. And for this part, this is very big, especially growing in your relationship with the Lord. And it's reading the word that is 
fundamental. So just there's no third piece to it. You know, it's not prayer is better than fasting, which is better than reading the word or vice versa and all that. But essentially, you put all three together. We read the word every day. We pray every day. We fast from time to time. Maybe you fast every morning from the moment you wake up to maybe noon or 3 p.m. I did that for a little bit. Um, That was something that the Lord led me to do, and it had really powerful results in my spiritual walk. Glory to the Lord. You can do that type of fast. Again, you'll be doing it in combination. The reason why you read the word is because you want to know what God said, because the Bible is the word of God. All 66 books in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, any Bible that has more than 66 books is considered a false Bible because it is a false Bible. There's false books in the Bible, things that are not sound, that are not doctrine, that are heresy. So, no, if the Bible you have has more than 66 books, that's it. Let it go. Throw it away. Do what you got to do. Get a Bible that has 66 books. That starts from Genesis to Revelation, and there's four Gospels in the middle, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why do you read the Word? Well, you want to know what God said. What did He do in the past that He is the same in the present and in the future? How He doesn't change, that He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. How is it that creation started? You know, how the creation of the universe came to be? What did Jesus say? What did He do? What is the story of the kings, like King David and King Saul? What are some of the Psalms that we get a lot of music from? What is Proverbs, the book of wisdom? What does it teach about having fear of the Lord? What does it teach about not being enticed by sinners? How to avoid the woman folly? How to, if you're a woman, how to be a Proverbs 31 woman? If you're a man looking to be married, Proverbs 18.22. How to find favor from the Lord to obtain a wife? So on and so forth. Stuff like that. And... It's knowing the commandments of God, whether you're in prayer or you're being tempted, you can discern one, if it's God speaking or if it's the adversary, if it's yourself or your emotion, because God does not contradict his word. He does not lie for he cannot lie. He is not a man who lies. He is God. He is the source of truth. He is the end all be all. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the God of Jacob, Isaac and Abraham. And it's only by reading the word you're able to know stuff and you're able to say it without having to look in the Bible because you know you've read it before and it's true. And for this part, we're going to the book of John, chapter 6, verses 25 through 35. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And the reason this portion of scripture, Jesus is saying this to the people is because he had just performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000 with the five loaves of bread and two fish. And everybody was satisfied. Everybody was full. They ate as much as they desired. And there was 12 baskets of food left over. So Jesus ends up being alone for a little bit and the people find him. But really, they just wanted food. They really didn't want teachings of the word. They didn't want teachings of Jesus. They just wanted to be physically nourished. And that's what Jesus was saying was that if you keep trying to eat physical food, you're not going to get anywhere. But you need the word of God to be sustained spiritually and physically because the spiritual is more important. For the physical shall pass away, but the eternal life is your glorified bodily state. And that's the regeneration in you. That is your flesh and process 
of being glorified because of what Jesus did on the cross. So he was making an example, pointing it back to Moses during his time with the Israelites, how God would feed his people by giving bread from heaven, the manna. So every morning they would eat it, and on the day before the Sabbath, they will, God would give a double portion for what they needed for that day and for the day of Sabbath because God said, no work on the day of Sabbath, it is a rest because it will be a future promise to our ultimate rest that is in Jesus Christ that we have now by accepting him as Lord and Savior. And then when he returns, we have the full rest of his kingdom officially on earth and we do whatever he has planned. We don't know, so we just got to wait. So as you continue to read the word, obviously, like I mentioned, you start with a few verses and then you gradually grow and wanting to know more and more and more. Unless you want to read the whole book in one day. Good luck. <laughs> Uh, probably is possible, but I don't know how effective it will be. But what I will say this, when you read the word, it transforms your mind. It corrects your way of thinking. You are transformed from your heart. You have a heart of flesh now and not a heart of stone. You know, how you speak is different. You don't speak with profanity anymore. How you act is different. How you walk is different. You know, you walk in the ways of the Lord, how he wants us to walk. All of that starts being transformed, and it's a process. That's why you got to go over and over and over by crucifying your flesh because the flesh does not want it. It hates things of God. So it says, I don't want this. I want to be on TikTok. I want to be on social media. I want to eat junk food. I want to eat greasy food. I want to sleep late. I want to wake up late. I don't want to work. I don't want to do this. I want to do nothing that pleases the Lord. And then you got to tell the flesh, and I could care less. It is the will of God that overrides you, and that's what we're going to do. By continuously reading the word, we become better men, better women, better husbands if you're married, better wives if you're married, better parents if you have children. If you are children, we become better children because we tend to rebel against our parents. We become better employers if you are bosses or managers. If you own a business, we become better CEOs or business owners. If you are employees, you become better employees to not only honor your managers, your employers, but also to honor the Lord who is our master as well. So overall, we are transformed. Society is transformed. And then we get to see the world from the perspective of God through his eyes. The world, even though it is broken and fallen, there is still beauty. There's still so much in it that the Lord is cultivating and building throughout time. Now, why do I say all this? If you go back to Psalm chapter 7, verses 8 through 17, our opening verse for everything, it boils down back to two options. You either accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you accept that he is God incarnate, that he is God who took on flesh, who lived a sinless life, who became sin on our behalf, who took the wrath of God in our place, who died in our place so that we may have eternal life, but that he resurrected on the third day, the shedding of his blood, his holy, righteous, pure blood on the cross is how he died. But because he resurrected on the third day, he defeated death, he conquered death, he defeated sin, he defeated the devil, he conquered him, and that we have eternal life by putting our trust and faith in him. We believe in him, we love him, and we obey him, and we do whatever it is that he wants to do so that we are able to walk in a relationship with God and recognize that we are saved, we are not judged, we do not have eternal condemnation, we don't have eternal punishment, but we are to cultivate our relationship with God by standing firm in the faith. And should you choose to reject that, then you stay as a rebel, you stay as a sinner, you stay on the path that leads to eternal destruction, that because you chose to reject salvation, you go there and we all start on that path until you accept jesus christ as lord and savior which is why i always mention it in every video to get you guys to understand that there is a path of eternal destruction that i do not want you guys to head i was headed on that path at one point and the lord by his grace and his mercy pulled me out set me free and now i do everything i can to proclaim the gospel and to reach out to those who are lost and say, don't go down this route. 
turn around, repent of your sin, repent of your old life, and turn to Christ. Because at the end of the day, we all die once, and then there's the judgment. And I don't want anybody out there to head to eternal condemnation, but I want them to obtain the gift of eternal life, of salvation, of grace, knowing that you get to not only live in that freedom now, but you and I will be with God in heaven when it is time. And then when Jesus returns, we'll be with him doing, again, whatever he pleases, whatever he desires. So we are just going to have to wait on that. And now why do I emphasize not wanting you guys to be judged? So if you decide to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you are judged by your works. So you have to be righteous in the eyes of the Lord. You have to fulfill the law of God. You have to live a perfect life, an obedient life. That means no lying, no stealing, no cheating, no no hatred, no thoughts of hate, no thoughts of murder. If you can live a perfect life externally, you have to live it internally as well. No lustful thoughts, no sexual immorality, nothing of that sort. And that is impossible because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, chapter 23, which is why Jesus Christ accepting the gift of salvation through him is the only way we are reconciled back to God the Father. Because through Jesus and Jesus alone. Is how we're able to get to the Father because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can go to the Father except through Him. And that is critical. And I don't want you guys to do that. And I want you guys to continue to grow your relationship with the Lord. I want you to read your word. I want you guys to pray. I want you guys to fast from time to time. This is something I do in my walk as well. I just don't announce that I'm fasting because it's in the word, you know, don't announce it. If people know you and they can see the subtle changes in your body and your face and all that, they'll know something's different. They'll know you're fasting. If the Lord doesn't lead you to say you're fasting, they'll say, no, you know, just, I'm just not eating. You know, I'm chill. He'll let you know how to say it, but don't go telling everybody I'm fasting. Look at me. No, at the end of the day, your relationship with the Lord, you're growing it. He's with you. You guys are walking hand in hand. He guides you. He leads you. He provides for you. He sustains you. He protects you. He does everything that he desires in your life. But the first and most important thing is to come to salvation, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so that you are set free from the clutches of sin, from the wages of sin, that you are set free from the world and that you're pulled out of darkness and into the light. So I hope this video has edified you i hope you guys are able to come to christ you guys came to salvation leave in the comments what other questions you guys want me to answer i'll be more than happy to obviously read them over and answer them but as always i pray that god blesses you i pray that you are blessed with this video as always take care stay safe have a good day bye